Romans chapter 2. The story is told of two men who go to the temple to pray. One is a very religious man. The other guy works for the IRS. He, no one likes him. The religious man goes to pray and says, Dear God, thank you that I am not like other people. I give of my tithes. I help the poor. I do great things. Amen. The tax guy, the IRS, stands before God and beats his chest, bows his head and says, God, be merciful to me. I am just a stinking sinner. I'm paraphrasing. (laughs) Jesus noticed those two guys. And he says, that guy, the second guy, in, in crying out for mercy, he went away forgiven. And Jesus said, the one who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And what a great picture, what a great illustration of what we're going to be looking at here in Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 1, Paul laid out the rebellious sinner, proving that, you know, our our sins have so corrupted us and so defiled us that the wrath of God is coming upon our sins, and they they can be very seen in in society and people's lives. But here now in chapter 2, Paul deals with the religious man, so to speak, or the moralist, the guy who wants to stand on his grounds of his works and his actions of all that he's done, That he says, listen, Paul says, listen, you're just as much a sinner as the guy who acts it out. Maybe you're a little bit more chicken. He didn't say chicken, but maybe you're a little bit more chicken to act it out. But inside your heart lurks the same evil things. And we live in a society with very much so in moral America that if you asked people this question, you'd get a similar response. How do you get to heaven? How do you know you're going to heaven? What would people say? I'm good enough. I'm better than the other guy. I haven't murdered anybody. You know, those are the common answers you get. But what if God's standard was different than our standard? What if God had a completely different standard that wasn't based upon your actions and your works, even your morality, but is based upon something else, his work? Then it would make things completely different. But Paul points out here in this chapter how we are all sinners. And now he deals with the moralist, the good guy, the nice American guy who just works hard and loves his family, but still knows deep within his heart there lurks the same things. And so this morning we're just going to get through the first five verses uh, because there's a lot of stuff within there to digest and and, uh, pick apart. But if uh, follow along with me, verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, Paul says, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For whenever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Paul says first here there are no excuses. There are, are, are no escapes. The moralist is the sinner just as much as the guy who acts it out. The immoral, the amoral, are all in the same boat with the moral called the USS sinner, and it's sinking. And the reason why he uses this this word inexcusable, which means basically you, you have no defense, you have no say, you are just completely at a loss. Why? Because God is going to judge us not according to just our actions, but according to our heart of where sin lurks within. See, from the heart is where things begin. From the heart is where the thoughts are affected and the motives and the actions come about. And so we go real deep to the heart and say, what is what is there? Well, here's what the Bible says in Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitfully, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. 
Jesus said in Matthew 15, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. That was the issue they were having, you know. So whether you're going to wash your hands before you eat or whether you, you, you know, they had all these rules and stuff. But Jesus says, listen, defilement and sin starts within. It starts deep within. It's in every single one of us, in our hearts. Whether we act upon it outwardly or not, we are still sinners. And the moralist has been so deceived by his sin that he begins to look at, oh, I am better than them because of what I do or don't do. I'm good enough for heaven because I haven't murdered anybody like that guy or I haven't committed adultery like that guy or, or this person over here. And, you know, we begin to compare ourselves. The moralist looks at himself to try to get one up on somebody else due to works. I'm better than them. And then he begins to get bitter towards them, the world. Oh, they're such a bunch of stinking sinners. He's sour-faced. He's got the smug on and he's bitter towards them because they're just rotten people. And then he starts blasting them verbally to make himself look better. To make himself look better, it's I got to pinpoint the faults of others so that I look better in my own eyes. It's a sad thing. I think we see it around us quite a bit, actually. And Paul points out here five things about the critical or the judgmental person that I think I want to I wanna just take some time to bring out. Number one, that this type of person, this moralist, <coughs> excuse me, is judgmental or he's critical in a condemning way. He's quick to uh, point out the failures of others in a condemning way. That's what he says in verse one. You're inexcusable, you who judge. And there are some people that just, they feel that they need to be the Holy Spirit in the lives of other people, that they need to be the one, the the police, so to speak, in God's eyes to help fix the world around them and make it right. And they can be so judgmental and condemning in their actions towards others. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And many of you have heard it from the world when people say, hey, see, even Jesus said, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Stop judging me, man. Who are you to tell me I can't do this? But Jesus used this word judge, which means actually to judge with condemnation, not discerning evil and good. He says, we are not called to be in a place to bring condemnation upon others and to have a pointing finger and a snarl and a a sneering at them, condemning them in their sins. That's not our place. But we are not, though we're not to judge with condemnation, we are to judge with identification. That is, with discernment. John 7, verse 24, Jesus said, judge with righteous judgment discern between what is evil and what is good. So when somebody says, hey, even Jesus said, don't judge, man, it's right there. Well, you know, a little later he said to judge, John 7. Oh, well, what's that all about? It means to discern. I want to identify what is good and evil and walk in what is good. So a guy comes to my house and he wants to date my daughter. You know what I'm going to be doing? I'm going to be discerning and identifying this dude. I'm going to find out more about him than he knows about himself. I'll find out your Facebook, your Snapchat, your Instagram. I'm going to grill you. I'm going to scare you, man. <laughs> and then I'm going to say, adios, dude. Here's the door. It's discernment. Oh, quit judging me. You're judging me. No, I'm not. I'm identifying what you've already revealed in your heart and deciding whether that's something I want or not. Maybe you'll get your life together sometime later and come back around and we'll have another discussion. But the point is, we need to make judgments with identification, with discernment, without bringing the condemnation that is solely reserved for God himself. Matthew 7, Jesus goes on, while he did say, don't condemn, he didn't stop there. He went on in the next verses and says, listen, you have a responsibility to help a brother who has a problem. There needs to be humility before the help. Look at what he says, Matthew 7, verse 3. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, if you ever got anything in your eye, an eyelash, a speck of dirt, a piece of metal that almost makes you blind, bro, when you get something of such small proportions in your eye. It drives you crazy. It drives you nuts. You're flushing it out. Can you imagine for a second, you've got a two by four in your eye. Hey, bro, what's going on, man? Oh, man, I got something in my eye. He's saying he's got a little speck. Oh, dude, let me help you out. You just knock him out. You got the two by four sticking out. It's a visual picture that Jesus says, look, what are you trying to fix the other guy with the little speck when you've got a big log hanging out of your own eye? Get the log out of your own eye first, and then you'll be able to help out your bro. It's humility. It doesn't mean I don't help him out. It's recognizing my own state first. Paul put it this way in Galatians chapter 6. He says this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, we have this obligation to one another. Oh, I, I, I can't, you know, I, I can't do that. I, who am I to judge them? No, 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 you're not judging them. You're helping them, pushing them closer to Jesus who takes care of everything. In humility, recognizing, man, I could fall into those same things and all I know is that the grace of God can heal and restore. And so let's both get to him ourselves. But the problem with the judgmental person, the moralist, so to speak, person who stands upon his works is that he brings no grace to the picture. He brings no helpful solution to the picture. Just rocks to prove that he stands bigger and better than you. Oh, we see it played out. Remember the the situation where there was a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, brought before Jesus And the Pharisees all took up stones and they said, Jesus, what should we do? They knew that if Jesus said, go ahead, throw the stones, that, well, he would lose the the impact with the people. He was called the friend of sinners. They would no longer see him that way. And yet they also knew that if he said, you know, put the stones down, that he would be going against the very law of Moses. So they thought, oh, we got Jesus trapped here. These guys have rocks in their hand. They care nothing about this woman who has sinned. And they're just ready to to nail her and drive her down. And Jesus begins to write on the ground. In silence, he starts writing on the ground. What's he writing? Some have proposed that he's writing the very sins that lurked in the hearts of those men who were throwing the stones. Maybe even the very women that they had relationships with. And these guys ended up dropping the stones and leaving one by one. And here is this woman in her brokenness sitting there. And Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, I don't know. There's no one around. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see, he relieved her of the condemnation to set her forward in a new relation with grace and freedom in Christ. That's the heart that we need to have. Number one, we have to be careful of the judgmental, critical attitude that starts condemning others. Number two, it's the hypocritical stance that they have as well. If you notice in verse one, when he says, you are inexcusable, O man, you whoever... You are who judge with condemnation. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. So you find that the moralist or the the, often the religious person is not only judgmental, trying to prove himself and condemning of others, but he's doing the very some of the very same things internally in his heart that he's so quick to point out the faults of others. It's called a deflection method. Somebody starts talking about a certain sin over and over. It really, sometimes it's what's lurking in their own heart. And they're just kind of deflecting it away. Like, like for example, you go into Costco this afternoon. Dangerous place, I know. You go into Costco, and as you're coming out, you see your neighbor. And he's got the thousand-inch TV that he just purchased. You have no idea that he's saved for years for this. But he's got this thousand-inch TV sitting in his cart. And you say, man, that guy doesn't need that thousand-inch TV. I know he's got a TV. Man, how materialistic can he be? You're making claims. 
Well, in your heart, what's happening is, boy, I wish I had that thousand-inch TV. You're kind of jealous. Or maybe the situation goes, as you say those things about him and what he's got, that you look down at your own cart as you're pushing it out that's overflowing with stuff, and you go, well, uh, uh, I'm different. I need these things. <laughs> Been there? You see, the point is, is that you may not sin in the same way as someone else, but you definitely do sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. God dealt with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23 because of their hypocrisy, that they were doing the very things that they were telling other people not to do. He says, you're, you're like a, a, a dirty cup on the inside, but the outside is really clean. You're like whitewashed tombs. The inside's full of dead men bones, but the outside man, it's a new paint all over the place. And they, Jesus was hard on them. In a sense, in our vernacular, you say, yo, bro, it's all show. You know, you missed it. You see, listen, the hardest people to win to Christ are those who think they, they are good enough for God.